at the end of 2019, I felt like we were a great, strong group, but uh, something happened in the pandemic and uh, it just affected ministry everywhere. What is up, everybody? Welcome to Café con Santos, season number four, a show where we promote the rosary, reflect on the life of the saints, and share many journeys in the faith. With me today, we have Santiago Banda from Hartford, Michigan, Diocese of Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo involved in various Hispanic ministries or just doing a lot of work with yeah. all kinds of people. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, welcome to anybody who's here for the first time. And also, thanks to all of those who have been with us since season one. So, Santiago, before we get started, I have to ask you the most important question. And there's only one correct oh, answer. Man. Are you ready? Yes. Do you like coffee? Yes. Yes. All right. Good. We're starting season four in the right way. So if you want to, yeah, I actually got some Café de Olla if you want to open oh, it up. Cup? Oh, I thought there was some in here already. So we got Café de Olla in there. We got our coffee right here. And as you're pouring yourself some of that stuff, uh, I just want to point out that Santiago got me a gift, actually, which is a uh, magazine for... Uh, Pokemon from what was it? 1999, Japanese. So uh, usually the the people doing the interview are the ones that give the gifts. But so um, now we're actually gonna start with prayer. So in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for Santiago. Thank you for the fact that he said yes to coming to this fourth season. I pray, Lord, that you send your Holy Spirit to be with us. Please uh, join us and, and help us to experience your love. I ask, Lord, that you also join the listeners wherever they're at with their life. If they're going through some difficult times or even if they're not, maybe if they're experiencing joy, Lord, that you may continue to fill them with your with your love. And I ask Our Lady that she protects us from the enemy so that we do not have any technical difficulties and that the enemy, enemy will not interfere and in whatever conversion may start to take in the hearts of the listeners. Today we are recording this on the feast day of Our Lady of Fatima and we thank you, Lord, in advance for this gift. Please help Santiago send your Holy Spirit to guide him and me so that it is your words that are being spoken and so that whatever we say, say for your glory, that we, not, we may not be prideful and we continue to just love to serve you, Lord. We ask all of this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, Santiago, so I like to ask this part of the podcast, Ask Santiago. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and you're just going to have to answer as honestly as possible. Okay. Ready? Yes. No questions? All right. If you could have a superpower, what would it be? Uh, definitely teleportation. All right. And uh, if you would teleport anywhere right now, where would you go? Um... Oh, I'm, I'm excited to be here, actually. Oh. Yeah. I probably would have teleported here because it was a far drive. But Yeah, yeah, there was a three hours, so yeah. yeah. Uh, are you a fan of country music? Uh, yes, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> are you a dog or a cat person? Oh, man. Um, probably more of a cat person, just because they're a little bit more somber. But I've, I met some some chill dogs. 
Uh, what set of mysteries do you like the most when praying the rosary? It had to be the, the glorious for sure. What was one of your favorite cartoons as a kid? Um, probably the one that I still quote with my friends would have to be SpongeBob, but but early SpongeBob up until like 2004, uh, everything before that. After that, it just wasn't the same. What What would be one of your top five quotes? Um. Uh, I don't know. It, it had to be like in the moment. Okay. Um, have you seen uh, the the ones that are in Spanish dub? No, I, I've never seen them. Though. There's this one where uh, he's uh, he, he's over at Sandy's. It's one of the earlier episodes, and he he doesn't have his water, right? Yeah. And, and he's like, in the water, the pitcher of water is right there. And usually in English, is I don't need it. <laughs> I don't need it. But like the voice in Spanish is so funny because it's like, no lo necesito. <laughs> no lo necesito. Definitivamente no lo necesito. So I, I recommend <laughs> for anybody who's curious to, to go check out that episode. Um, That's actually the one I was thinking of. I was looking at the coffee. I don't need it. <laughs> uh, if you were giving a thousand dollars, what is the first thing you would do with it? Uh, probably... I had to pay off some of my student debt. Oh man, that's real. What is one thing that most people do not know about you? Um. Well, the, as the years keep going on, something that I believe less and less of myself is that I used to break dance competitively. Yeah. I wasn't very good, but I would do it. <laughs> I don't know, man. That's that's humble because I think I seen some posts on Instagram. Oh yeah, you were doing some kind of spins, right? Yeah, yeah, but I, I never made it past like the preliminary rounds in any, in any event, any jam. Also, oh, you did it like competition style. Yeah, a few times, uh, with my older brother. But once he stopped doing it, I, I kind of stopped as well. Okay, what is your dream job? My dream job. I think right now anything in ministry, you dream for me. Or I've always wanted to be a teacher. Maybe maybe college for little kids. Is there any song or music genre that annoys you? Hmm. No, I, I don't think so. Um, I really was hating on Corridos Tumbados for a while. But I just, l lately I've gotten into them. It's uh, kind of embarrassing to admit. Here's a question though. Have you heard of... Corridos tumbados cristianos. Yeah, maybe, maybe those. Or like, <laughs> whenever they cringy, kinda, right? <laughs> yeah, they're kind of cringy. Whenever they try to like put in reggaeton in the iglesia yeah. too, like no, mm -hmm. I can't. Like, I don't know. It just, it just doesn't seem right to me, you know. Yeah. And then, if you could be the patron saint of one thing, what would it be? Outer space, an option. Like, oh. could you take all of outer space, or do you, would you have to pick like a patron saint of space? Oh. I th that, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I was. Uh, huh. Is there? Do, do the planets get their own saints? Stars. Uh, good question. We'll have to put it somewhere here on the <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> okay. But in general, patron saint of space. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, thank you for that segment of Ask Santiago. All right, Santiago. So now that we've got this ball rolling, we've taken a couple of sips of coffee. I'm going to invite you to just share a little bit about who you are, a little bit about your testimony, and really just whatever right now you feel comfortable sharing with the, the audience about who you are, yeah. your journey in the faith. So my name is Santiago Banda. My family is from Guanajuato, Mexico. Puro Guanajuato. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so I've, I've lived in Southwest Michigan my whole life, pretty much. And I've, for the most part, I belong to the parish of Ackley Conception in Hartford. And right now I'm studying theology, University of Notre Dame. Um, I say that lightly because... Sometimes it still feels like I'm a beginner in learning. And, um, no, a master's, right? Yeah. Um, 
God willing, I graduate uh, end of June. So excited for that. Well, well the, the people who are watching this might not know is that you're from, uh, you used to be the coordinator for a ministry, Hispanic youth ministry called Jornadas. Over here in uh, Detroit, we have Jornadas and then uh, similar in a similar way, you guys have a, a retreat called Jornadas as well. So it's 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 the the same retreat, the same movement, but in a different style of the retreat. Um, can you can you share? I guess just what what got you to Jornadas? Like, because I think I don't know your experience, but when I lived my Jornada, it was like the the second or third time that I was invited to to live the retreat. Because previous to that, I was like, no, that. A Christian stuff is not for me. I don't know what your experience was. Yeah, so I was invited when I was around. I was barely turning 20. And the priest at my parish. Okay, one of the reasons was I was looking for friends in, in the faith. Uh, somebody that I could connect to. Uh, specifically Catholics. Because in my first early years in college, I had some friends, but they were evangelical methodist or baptist and sometimes it was a little difficult to, to talk to them to connect with them uh especially because uh, they viewed it they viewed catholicism in such a negative way and so uh in one sense i was i was looking to to make some friends in the faith and so that that's my positive answer but uh, there's also the priest at my parish, he was like, he really wanted me. I actually still wants me to, to go to the seminary to be a priest. And, um, like it was like a couple months before I lived the jornada. He was like pressuring me, pressuring me. And I was like, I don't know, like, I don't think I'm ready. I don't, I haven't really thought about it. And he was like, okay, well, if you're not going to go to the seminary, at least go to this retreat. And I was like, okay, I'll do that. You know, just to kind of get him off my back. And by this time was your faith already kind of solid? No, not at all. He just saw me as like, as somebody that you know, um, had certain characteristics, maybe because I was like obedient. Um, I wasn't too like, um, I didn't really get into trouble. Like, so maybe he kind of saw that. I don't know what he saw in me, honestly. You know, sometimes you just see somebody and you're like, you be a good priest. Yeah. Or just on a superficial level. But yeah, so then I went and I thought it was great. Uh, actually, the retreat itself, um, it was kind of more like opening a door into Catholicism. I don't really remember the retreat itself like having like a super strong impact on me, but it was, it was more like I knew there was something there and I wanted to continue to learn about it. And in my, in my thoughts, in my mind, I kind of was like, okay, if I don't find anything here, I'll just move on to the next thing, you know? And before this, um, you said you were like around the age of 20, uh, you went to undergrad, right? Yeah. What, what can you share with us about that experience? Uh, yeah. So I think that kind of fits into my testimony. Do you want to like, you want yeah, me to yeah, go, go, go right ahead. Okay. Uh, so well, I think there's two parts to that. So one part is the music. Uh, so what really kind of got me after I lived the Jornada, I started playing guitar in the, in the choir at church during mass and, uh, just listening to those songs every week or paying more attention to them because when you're playing them, you, you kind of have to play, pay a little bit more attention rather than just. It was more like a direct kind of thing, um, rather than just listening to it. Um, but, um, yeah, so I started listening more and the words were just, were just beautiful, you know, uh, the, the Flori Canto songs specifically. It was, there was something about those songs and some of the prayers like, uh, Oración to San Francisco specifically. That was one of my favorite songs for a while. And, you know, just, Playing the song really got me into just thinking about what the words meant and 
uh, when I started to look more into it, I found out there was bigger meaning rather than it just being a song, you know? And so, okay, that, that's, that's the first part. The second, the second part is maybe to use like some scriptural language. Cause I've, I've tried to put this into words before, but, um, been a little difficult to, to understand how I even got here you know, to, uh, studying theology and to being so involved uh, in the parish. And so I originally started studying accounting. And after I lived, so accounting involves working with numbers, things, um, you know. And after living the jornada, uh, I kind of wanted to work with people. And so I started, I, I got the associates in accounting and I, I was a tax accountant for a while. I, I liked the job. I was good at it, but I just, I wanted, I was looking for something more fulfilling and I felt like God pulling me towards the movement and towards the church. And so after that, after living the jornada, I, I went in and I started, I, I switched majors to like communications, business, and, or like something that, that would allow me to work with people. And, and then after that, I felt like God was still, after getting the bachelor's, I felt like God was still calling me for more. And so I was, I was, uh, you know, I was always hesitant a little bit, but uh, eventually um, there was an opportunity to study theology. And so I was like, all right, God didn't, God called me to work uh, with more than just things. God called me to work with more than just people. God called me to work with their souls. And so I always thought that was, uh, you know, it was a process, definitely purgative in some senses, um, living it. Because this was like over the span of, of like eight years getting to where I am now. Where would you say was the first year? Where, where was that starting point? Um, what do you mean? Like, so you said it was a span of eight years to be where you are right now. Mm -hmm. Where, where do you, where would you say was that, that first, that beginning? Uh, well, definitely the, the first year of college, um, just the friends that I met, um, I was, uh, having this, it was even before Jornadas, um, God was still, was already calling me because the first experience that I had was just a couple of buddies. Um, they weren't even Catholic, but, uh, one, one of my friends and, uh, I still hold him in high regard. Uh, he, he invited me out to a bonfire and, and I thought it was just, you know, uh, the boys, uh, kicking it back at the bonfire and a couple beers. Uh, no, we were like 18, 19. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, drinking wasn't even on my mind, but we were, we were just sitting around the campfire, um, uh, making s'mores or something. One of the guys had a guitar and it was like, all right, guys, talk about Jesus. And I was like, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> I, I, I knew this was too good to be true. <laughs> and then he was like, and then everybody went around and started talking about their faith, you know, their life. And, uh. Uh, he was uh, pretty mature for his age. We we're only like 18, but he had a good understanding of his own faith. And then from, from then on, I was, that, that always stayed with me. Um, he invited me to a, like a Christian rock concert here in Detroit. Early. Is it okay we shout him out? Uh, yeah, yeah. His name's Aaron. Hi, Aaron. <laughs> hey, Aaron. If you're watching this, <laughs> thank you. I, I did... Uh, not too long ago, maybe like a few years ago, I sent him a message and thank you. But yeah, I think that's where it started. You know, as soon as I got into college, because I was really introverted in high school. And uh, like I said, I was just like an obedient kid, just getting through my classes, getting through school. And then once I got into college, I wanted to start you know, living out my life, being more of a protagonist. Go oh, Francis. But. So like... Uh so as he, so that was his plan, right? Was uh, they would be, uh, in a way, just sharing about their faith, but you didn't know this in advance. I don't think any of us knew it. Cause so, <laughs> well, do you think it was just kind of improvised on his regard, or he knew from the beginning? All right, I'm gonna go talk to these guys about Jesus, or who knows? Uh, I, I think in, in some sense, yeah, he, th that was um, premeditated. Yeah, and uh, what would you say was that experience like? Because I mean. When I was 18, I don't think I had ever had 
a an encounter with Christ. And so the thought of somebody just, you know, and, and it's a good environment, right? We got a bonfire, we got a guitar, and then people just start sharing about their faith. Like in many ways, I think when I was in college, I never got to experience something like that until much later when I had to go through my craziness in life. But as these guys are, you know, just playing the guitar and and people are, are sharing about what Jesus has done in in their life, what was that experience for you? It, in a sense, it was, I don't think I was ready for it. Um, I definitely felt that my, my, I didn't really have an understanding of my own faith. I knew I was Catholic, but um, immediately, I remember telling them that I was Catholic and them having some sort of like questions. And I, I knew I couldn't defend it. But at the same time, um, they were really respectful about it. Um, and I think he just, okay, maybe I'm getting lost here. So he, I, my experience was just that, that it, it was a great, you know, it was a great moment. It wasn't anything like, he wasn't putting pressure on me to, to convert or to accept Jesus Christ into my heart or anything like that as my personal Lord and Savior. But, uh, you know, just opening up the conversation, I think it was, it was uh, like the Holy Spirit was moving that day. I think it was, it was something really relaxed. Um, I didn't feel like overwhelmed or anything, but from that moment on, I was like, you know, I gotta, I should probably know what I believe in. Like, I should probably understand it at least a little. And I started kind of, and that, that was the beginning of, of something. I think that was really special in my life. And t- to this day, I don't know how it happened, but I feel like it was such a gift from the Holy Spirit. But that second year in college, uh, it, it took me one year, but I was reading three chapters of the Bible every night before I went to bed. It took me like a whole year to, to three read. chapters. Yeah, yeah. Like 15 minutes a night. But like to this day, I still don't, I don't have that much discipline anymore for some reason, but getting through the Bible that like I was doing Bible, Bible in a year before father. (laughs) That was, that was just me. Um, I didn't, I didn't understand most of it. I didn't, especially like getting into Leviticus and stuff, but I was, I was getting through it. I was like, I don't understand what's going on, but I'll read it. And I stuck through it. It was great. What do you think was one of the biggest things that stood out to you? Uh, maybe more memorable readings when you were going through the, the, the three times, three chapters a day? Uh, what was most memorable? Yeah, what would you say was like, was there anything that like really stood out to you about one of the scriptures? Um, no, it really, it just kind of helped me place um, the whole story into context. Because uh, before that, people would just tell me, you know, just, just read the New Testament, or, you know, or just read the Gospels specifically. And I didn't know that the Bible was, was an actual like story, like it had a beginning and an end, but I kind of just thought it was random books that they just put together. And so I didn't really have an idea of what the Bible actually was. And so reading it from, from beginning to end, it kind of put the story more or less into context of you know, starting from Genesis, the patriarchs, and then... Exodus and then the prophets, kings, you know, things like that. And so, um, and then once, once I got into like the gospels, I was like, oh, so this is, a, this is the story of Jesus coming. Fulfillment. Yeah. Nice. And so jumping forward back to, um, to Jornadas, you, you said it was like a span of roughly around eight years. Um, what, what can you tell us about what Jornadas is like for those who like are listening and have never heard of it? What, what would be your, your pitch to them about what it is? I know that's a big thing to ask, but in in summary, like what, what would you say it is? Uh, well, one of the, one of the things that I've always appreciated Jornadas for is 
is obviously the um, young adults evangelizing other young adults, but that it's in the context of well, I don't, for us, it's it's like in the context of our culture as well. So like we, during the jornada or after we celebrate, um, you know, these uh, traditions that we have, like. Virgen de Guadalupe or the Posadas, and I, I always, I always appreciated that because I think for, uh, for being Mexican American, um, without those certain traditions, um, I think some of the faith gets lost, um, or some of the, some of the love for the faith kind of gets lost. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, so um, it's a four-day retreat led by young adults, evangelizing young adults. Yeah, yeah. So the the initiation is always the the retreat, right? Um, pre jornada. The, the pre jornada into the jornada and post jornada, um, which is over the span of like three weeks. Um, well, that's how you guys do it as well. Um, well. Kind of. Yeah, and then uh, moving into kind of the the continual faith formation um, on a weekly basis, how we do it is I think it's also really important um, to build a community, you know, to continue to build on the spiritual life, and, and yeah, all right, and then uh, along the years, eventually you became one of the leaders there and then eventually became a coordinator, right? Yeah. Well, what can you tell us about what it's like being a coordinator for, for a movement like that? It was, uh, I think it was great, but my experience is that my experience specifically was, uh, so I was also a part of the group that, that started Jornadas in, in our parish. And so we didn't have a lot of, um, formation ourselves and so a lot of it was us learning along the way um, how to how to be leaders how to organize how to be a part of a, a greater scope of the church community sense because um, i mean in context and over, over here in uh in detroit jornadas has been around well just a, a brief history jornadas is a branch I believe from the Corsillo moment for those who know Corsillos. And so back in the, I want to say 60s or 70s, a group of priests came from Spain who were involved in, in ministries themselves and started uh, what we now know, what we now called El Movimiento de Jornadas de Vida Cristiana. And it was originally intended for men who were in college and was really a way for them to share about their faith, evangelize other other young men. Along the time, there were uh, eventually women who became part of the movement as well. And right now in Mexico, it's, it's, a, it's a big movement. There's, you could say, jornadas all over the states. And uh, around the year 1999, uh, a group brought jornadas from Mexico, I believe La Ciudad de Mexico, if I'm getting my 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 history wrong, uh, sorry, Ruth. <laughs> you guys could go check out the episode we did with Ruth. She she's an OG when it comes to jornadas. But it was brought to Detroit since 1999. So along the years, we we've had uh, at least my, me we've had that privilege of having the uh, the things passed on to us and and you could say guidance of older mentors who know what the movement is is about who who could walk us through that path but you would say your experience was well we're, we're kind of like the founders in a way and yeah. we're just kind of learning along the way as best as we can yeah I, um so i've definitely um learned learned to appreciate the journey a little bit more but i think also the the pandemic um you know, just like everything else it, it kind of affected us in a way because as we were getting our grounding we started in 2017 and as we were getting our grounding up 2019 at the end of 2019 i felt like we were a great strong group but uh, something happened in the pandemic and uh, it just affected ministry everywhere 
And then now, now there's this resurgence starting to, to come up again. Um, and, I, and I feel it in young adults. Uh, all the work that I've been doing in ministry, there's almost like people are crying out for, for something more in their life. Uh, but the only difference is now there's a lot more. There's, there's also been this like change in Hispanic ministry. I don't know if you've noticed it or if it's just uh, me barely realizing it. Because uh, Jornadas originally was intended for like immigrants, people to find community here. And so, and now it's, it's becoming more for like second generation Hispanics who some of them don't even speak Spanish anymore. And so we're also contending with that of you know, what is, what are their necessities and how can we best serve them and how can we meet them where they're at and take them to where they want to go? Yeah. Cause uh, over in here in Detroit, uh, the, the original groups tended to be, um, men who came from Mexico and they didn't necessarily have any family in Detroit. And so their only family was the community that they met in the church, specifically those who were in Jornadas. And so, uh, there, there's been a wide variety of people from ba different backgrounds, some who were in college, some who you know, are, are workers or even, you know, some people who, who struggle with, with addictions. And so I, I think in Detroit, I, I see that as well, uh, that there's in our community here in Southwest Detroit, there are many second generations. We're not going to have a, a short break to hear from our sponsors. Hi, my name is Kayla and I'm the manager here at Momento Gelato and Coffee. We have 14 flavors of gelato that rotate through the year seasonally and we have amazing coffee. Um, we are both the coffee makers and the gelato makers who make everything from scratch. We also have trivia nights on Wednesdays. So come check us out. Be a great time, family friendly. And thank you to Cafe Con Santos for being a partner with us for this video. This episode of Cafe Con Santos is brought to you by the Basilica of St. Anne's de Detroit. St. Anne's is a French origin church that was established in 1701 with their current building built in 1886. There are a few things that were brought from the previous church, which was the stone church. These are the body of Father Gabriel Richard, our founder, currently rests in our chapel. A hand-carved altar rail that was carved in 1853 and is currently in our church. The 1818 cornerstone from the stone church. The statue of St. Anne that's on the shrine, which also contains a first-class relic of hers. And the chapel's altar from 1818 that Father Gabriel Richard used to celebrate Mass in. This church took about one year to build, and all pews were hand-carved. This is a French neo-Gothic structure, so everything points up. There are many known miracles, mostly around St. Anne's Feast Day, which is July 26. A lot of people come and pray for fertility and to find a good spouse. In the 1960s, St. Anne's Church was in the verge of closing. But thanks to the surplus of Hispanic community, it was able to stay afloat, and it has been a multicultural church since. Through the years, many parish ministries have served in the Southwest community, including Jornadas, Knights of Columbus, Guadalupanas, to mention a few. Good St. Anne, you were specially favored by God to be the mother of the Most Holy Virgin Mary, and thus grandmother of our Savior Jesus Christ. By your intimacy with your most pure daughter and her divine son, kindly obtain for us the graces that we seek, the cure for us the strength to perform faithfully our daily duties, and the help we need to persevere in the love of Jesus and Mary. Madre de Maria y Abuela de Jesús, ruega por nosotros. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, Santiago just finished sharing a little bit about his journey in the faith, talked about jornadas, talked about ministry. Now we're going to jump into the second part of this episode where we're going to reflect on the life of a Catholic saint. And today's saint is actually 
high quality. I mean, all the saints are cool, uh, but we're going to be talking about Saint Peter, San Pedro. I'm going to share a short biography, and then Santiago and I, we're just going to have a talk about how his life affects us today. Saint Peter is mentioned so often in the New Testament, in the Gospels, in the Acts of the Apostles, and in the Epistles of Saint Paul, that we feel we know him better than any other person who figured prominently in the life of the Savior. In all, his name appears 182 times. We have no knowledge of him prior to his conversion, save that he was a Galilean fisherman from the village of Bethsaida or Capernaum. There is some evidence for supposing that Peter's brother Andrew and possibly Peter himself were followers of John the Baptist and were therefore prepared for the appearance of the Messiah in their midst. We picture Peter as a shrewd and simple man of great power for good, but now and again afflicted by sudden weakness and doubt, at least at the outset of his discipleship. After the death of the Savior, he manifested his primacy among the apostles by his courage and strength. He was the rock on which the church was founded. It is perhaps Peter's capacity for growth that makes his story so inspiring to other erring humans. He reached the lowest depths on the night when he denied the Lord, then began the climb upward to become Bishop of Rome, Martyr, and finally, keeper of the keys of heaven. Our first glimpse of Peter comes at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. While he was walking along the shore of Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, Peter, and Andrew, casting a net into the water. When he called to them, Come, and I will make you fishers of men, they at once dropped their nets to follow him. A little later, we learn that they visited the house where Peter's mother-in-law was suffering from a fever, and Jesus cured her. This was the first cure witnessed by Peter, but he was to see many miracles, for he stayed close to Jesus during the two years of his ministry. All the while he was listening, watching, questioning, learning, sometimes failing in perfect faith, but in the end full of strength and thoroughly prepared for his own years of missionary preaching. Let us recall a few of the biblical episodes in which Peter appears. We are told that after the miracle of the loaves and fishes, Jesus withdrew to the mountain to pray, and his disciples started to sail home across the Lake of Galilee. Suddenly they saw him walking on the water, and according to the account in Matthew, Jesus told them not to be afraid. It was Peter who said, Lord, if it is thou, bid me come to thee over the water. Peter set out confidently, but suddenly grew afraid and began to sink. And Jesus stretched forth his hand to save him, saying, O thou of little faith, why didst thou doubt? Then we have Peter's dramatic confession of faith, which occurred when Jesus and his followers had reached the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Jesus, having asked the question, Who do men say that I am? There were various responses. Then Jesus turned to Peter and said, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered firmly, Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. Then Jesus told him that his name would henceforth be Peter. In the Aramaic tongue, which Jesus and his disciples spoke, the word was kepha, meaning rock. Jesus concluded with the prophetic words, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock shall be built my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There seems to be no doubt that Peter was favored among the disciples. He was selected with James and John to accompany Jesus to the mountain, the scene of the transfiguration, to be given a glimpse of his glory, and there he heard God pronounce the words, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. After this, the group had gone down to Jerusalem, where Jesus began to prepare his disciples 
for the approaching end of his ministry on earth. Peter chided him and could not bring himself to believe that the end was near. When all were gathered for the Last Supper, Peter declared his loyalty and devotion in these words, Lord, with thee I am ready to go to both to prison and to death. It must have been in deep sorrow that Jesus answered that before cock crow, Peter would deny him thrice. And as the tragic night unrolled, this prophecy came true. When Jesus was betrayed by Judas as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane and was taken by soldiers to the Jewish high priest, Peter followed far behind and sat half hidden in the courtyard of the temple during the proceedings. Pointed out as one of the disciples, Peter three times denied the accusation, but we know that he was forgiven and when after the ascension Jesus manifested himself to his disciples, he signaled Peter out and made him declare three times that he loved him, paralleling the three times that Peter had denied him. Finally, Jesus charged Peter with dramatic brevity, feed my sheep. From that time on, Peter became the acknowledged and responsible leader of the sect. The latest archaeological findings indicate that St. Peter's Church in Rome rises over the site of his tomb, as Pius XII announced at the close of the Holy Year of 1950. In the catacombs, many wall writings have been found which link the name of St. Peter and St. Paul, showing that popular devotion to the two great apostles began in very early times. Paintings of later date commonly depict Peter as a short, energetic man with curly hair and beard. In art, his traditional emblems are a boat, keys, and a rooster. He is the patron saint of fishermen, net makers, and shipbuilders. His feast day is June 29th. Saint Peter, pray for us. All right, Santiago, so anything about that biography that just kind of stood out to you? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I think there was, uh, so praying to the saints, uh, something that's kind of new for me, really. Um, and, but I, there's just something that, that's uh, called out to me about specific saints, mostly when I can relate to them, you know. And so St. Peter, there, there's, there's two things. Um, actually, there's three things. One of them has to do with, with uh, what I'm writing. So for, uh, for the theology, uh, my final project, <clears throat> we were given the liberty to choose on on a specific topic, uh, reintroducing it um, to a specific audience. And I chose uh, specifically the priesthood um, to kind of speak about that priesthood through, uh, through a lens of like scripture, like how, it, how it has developed from Genesis all the way to, to where we're at now. And I think Peter, Peter as priest, um, in that sense, he kind of calling out to me as I was, as I've been thinking about you know, writing, writing up this, this capstone that I'm going to do. Um, but mo most importantly, the, there, there's two specific things that, that called out to me. One is, one is him. It's just a model of, would you say reconciliation? You no, know, um, denying Peter or denying Peter, denying Jesus, uh, three times, um, as he's, about to be crucified. I, I think to some extent, you know, the mistakes, mistakes or sins that I've created, <laughs> sins, sins that I've uh, committed, uh, sometimes I've, I've felt like that, you know, like, am, can I still be forgiven? Can I still be forgiven? And, uh, you know, Peter, I think in that sense, asking for forgiveness for yeah, asking for forgiveness. You know, it, in some instance, it, it gave me as well the courage to continue to go and practice the sacrament of confession and like on a regular basis. 
you know, and it, it's something that that gives me peace of mind, uh, peace of heart, really. And that that's one thing. The other thing is, uh, I, I just relate to his his like just to the gospel narrative. So when you know when, when we encounter Peter, you know he's 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 working, you know, and and Jesus calls him out from being just this this fisherman uh, to be a fisher of men, and that's kind of how I felt, you know. Uh, so I grew up working on on farms. I was just out, you know, just a just a country boy, just you know, out here. Um, I don't know how big my dreams were uh, of what I could do with my life, but it's almost like Jesus has slowly called me out to an adventure. Be like, you know, like, and it, like I said uh, in the testimony, like it's been slow, it's been gradual. He's let me take my time, you know, to to get accustomed to it, to what he might want for my life. And in a similar way, like Peter, um, you know, he's just like a, in some instances, he's just like a go-getter, you know, like he just goes out there and makes mistakes. And I, I really appreciate that because, you know, I, I think in ministry, I've made a lot of mistakes, uh, but Peter always comes back. Like, uh, you know, when, for example, when he goes out to walk on the water uh, and you know, he's like, yeah, I can do this. And, you know, he, he sinks. And, you know, sometimes I feel like that. I'm like, yeah, like I, I could definitely do that. And then I sink. And then uh, it's like, Jesus is the only one that can pull me out. Uh, or there's the moments where it feels like I'm walking on water and it's like, I'm there with Jesus. And then once again, under the water, but, <clears throat> you know, always keeping my sight on Jesus or my eyes focused on him. I, th I think that's, that's great. And specifically, uh, it's called the, what, the great consolation after Jesus tells him to throw the nets to the water and they pull out the fish. And Peter says something along the lines of, you know, depart from me. I'm a sinner. And Jesus tells him, do not be afraid. And you know, those are the words that, that God had spoken to all the people of Israel, um, in the old Testament. And, to put those words on Peter and, and to think, you know, I'm at least a little bit like Peter or in that, in that sense that I'm, I was just like this, this guy on a farm. Um, no, not, not too many expectations, but Jesus tells me, you know, don't be afraid. Uh, here's uh Here's, here's your path. You know? yeah. Yeah. I think for me, one of, one of the things that sticks out to, to me is just the, the fact that he's always like, yes, Lord, I'll do, I'll, I'm willing to die for you <laughs> until the end. And moments later, I don't know that man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he's like, uh, I don't know. In, in some ways, I, like I, I've been told that I'm a very passionate person, sometimes has a, high temper or I don't know if that's mm -hmm. the right way I could snap on somebody although I don't think I'm like that but yeah. I have a friend his name is Jose and he's always like Uncle Richie he's gonna cuss you out if you do the <laughs> wrong thing I'm like okay Jose but anyways I, I've heard it said that Peter in a in a similar way he, he's just kind of like energetic in that sense where he's passionate towards the Lord yeah. and like there have been many points in my life when I feel like that zeal for the Lord but like Peter, I also, I fail. And I think the fact that for a brief moment, Peter was walking on water. Yeah. Like for us, you know, I think we've, we've become so used to just reading it. They were like, yeah, you know, he just started walking on water. But I, like, I don't know about you, but like, when was the last time you saw somebody <laughs> walking on water? Uh, and so that, that took a, a, I don't know. In part because Jesus was there and, and Jesus, in a way, asked him and commanded him. And because he is God, he can make it happen. But at, at the same time, I think because Peter had that faith to trust in the Lord, you know, the, the faith uh, that, that could move mountains, that type of faith, he was able to do something that was you know, contrary in a way to the laws of physics. He, he just had a tremendous amount of faith that... 
that I personally respect. Um, I don't know why. We, we've talked about how he was a fisherman and you know, Jesus told him, throw your net to yeah. the sea, pull out the fish. And those words to me, in, and I think to many people, of you will now be fishers of men, kind of like has a, a special place in my heart. Um, have you ever, exp I know you shared a little bit about how it's, it's been a, a gradual process over the years, but when, when would you say was a recent or maybe not so recent, but memorable time when you could hear those words spoken to you from Christ? Maybe not like literal words verbally, but like where in your heart you're like, all right, this is where the Lord is calling me. Yeah, so I think it something awakened in me when when I actually came into being coordinator of of jornadas, and I didn't know what to do with it at first. But as so, there's this song we sing called Alma Misionera, and it, it kind of has the same vein of Pescador de Hombres, and it says. <clears throat> Llévame donde los pueblos necesiten tu palabra. And I would always sing that so carelessly until the day Jesus was like, all right, ahora sí te voy a llevar. And it's like, he sent me like so many different places <clears throat> that, you no, know, and to reach out to so many young adults that sometimes I don't, I don't know what to do with it, but except for like, just appreciate the moment, do what I can. And, you know, sometimes it's, sometimes the evangelization is great. Other times, you know, it feels like, it feels like just went in one year and came out the other. But, um, yeah, this 2022 was, was just a great year for me. Um, being able to be out on mission. Yeah. Let's talk That's, a little bit about that. Cause I, I saw your Instagram and every now and then you, you threw like a, almost you say a bombardment of photos from different places. Like what, can you start like listing a, a couple of those different places that you went to? Yeah. So most of it is, uh, thanks to Catholic extension. Shout, shout out, out to sh Catholic yeah. extension. <laughs> shout out to Catholic extension. They're great. They're doing the Lord's work, uh, over, over there in that organization. They put me in contact with, with Seppi. And Seppi is the Southeast Pastoral Institute and invited me out a few times. Uh, very thankful to them. Um, one of them was uh, when Pope Francis had called for the synod on synodality. And we went down to, we were in Miami. A few people from the Diocese of Kalamazoo went with me as well. It involved some, some education, some going out on, on mission. And one thing we did specifically, we reached out to... <laughs> To like the homeless community down there. Uh, Catholic Extension, they also had this program uh, with MAC, Mexican American Catholic College, San Antonio. And I was able to study there for a week. Um, and then it's the program is called Encuentro Mision. So uh, we were like learning a little bit. And then we did an immersion program at the, at the border. Uh, we helped them with like clothes, food water, shelter. The big thing that I got from those, from those missions was this idea of solidarity. Yeah, so solidarity is like, um, so like having like this compassion or being able to put yourself in somebody's shoes, you know, mm -hmm. and really understanding their situation. And I had never felt like I had understood the concept before because we had studied it in class, but actually being there with like uh, the families that were coming into the U S uh, for the first time, that was a really moving experience. And it was all in the, in the context of like faith and you know, they were prayed with them. We served them and it, it was just a, a beautiful experience and uh, something that, that I always carry with me. Yeah. So what I'm thinking about is, uh, when Jesus says, whatever you did for the least of these, of these, you did for me. And so 
um, oftentimes here in Southwest Detroit, I, I tend to come across people from different backgrounds, a lot of them who, who are homeless and, and sometimes need, uh, you know, just somebody to talk with. And so when, when you said that word solidarity, it, it made me think about how, you know, uh, the, the commandment of love God above everything and love your neighbor. And, and the fact that there, there's almost like, there are, I feel like, I don't know about you, but I feel like our culture, our society misses out on those kinds of experiences when you get to be a source of Christ's love to another person. And so, for example, there's a, one time when uh, I, I started to have a friendship with with a person who, who was a beggar. And, you know, um, it, it was very simple. You know, sometimes, honestly, I'm, I'm not that wealthy right now, <laughs> so yeah. I can't always give money, but I do offer my friendship. And I knew that, and I, I started to realize that little by little, that person opened up their heart to me. And, and little by little, started to share, you know, just things that, that were really affecting them. And I would say our culture that is so caught up with social media, with, with uh, utilitarianism or, or finding things uh, useful only if you could get something out of it, uh, they miss out on the fact that there are people that are genuinely suffering uh, who just need someone to acknowledge their dignity. And so I feel like perhaps when you went out into those areas, there were people who had nothing, who had, you know, maybe a little bit of faith and in, in, in a hope in, in, a, in a bright future. And what did you do for them? Give them food, shelter, prayed for them. And I think that oftentimes that... Uh, we, it's like we, we disconnect from those people who, who need Christ the most. And, and I feel like, I don't know if that's similar to, to what your experience was like. Yeah, so in theology, um, so, so studying theology, I think coming into it, I was uh, a little bit unsure about what it was. And um, for a while there, I thought it was this, uh, you know, head in the clouds, big brain theories about, you know, about the concept of God or um, concepts of doctrines, uh, dogmas within the church. And something that, that remains true time and time again, and I can't escape it no matter what, is uh, two things. The, the first is that theology really only makes sense um, from my experience if it's done so in a pastoral manner, it's, if it's used for the right purposes, because you, you get nothing in some sense about just, just reading your books all day and, and g- gaining all this knowledge if you're not going to use it for the good of the people or you know, to help somebody else you know, strive towards their own salvation. Or Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the other thing is that um, and I'll never forget this. Um, and I probably say it wherever I go. I never, uh, somebody asked me anything about theology and, and, um, cause you know, it, it's easy to, to tend to get prideful and whatever you've learned to be like, Oh, I understand this. And got a uh, master's in theology. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, but, uh, as I was starting out, uh, one of the, one of, uh, one guy in specific, he, he, um, what is it called? Kind of, he humbled me to, to say it like that. He told me, you know what, Santiago, nobody cares if you're studying theology. Uh, the world doesn't need more priests. The world doesn't need more theologians, more professors, more you know, doctrinal doctors and all these things. The world needs people who know how to love. Like you learn that and that's all you're going to need. And so anything that I've ever learned, I've, I've tried to put it in that context, tried to say, you know, 
am I learning this just for the sake of knowing? Or is this for the betterment of somebody else? And, you know, it, it's a big game changer. Um, that was that was a humbling experience. I, I thought I was a hotshot for a sec, you know, masters in theology. But uh, it means nothing if, if you don't use it for good church yeah. of God. I agree. I've heard of stories of saints who would uh, give their most expensive theology books and use that money to give to, to the poor. And so, in a way, all of this knowledge that we gain is really to not necessarily for ourselves directly, but as a way to help the church and help God's people. Um, I don't know, like, I know this, this might be a big question, but like, in this journey you've had, like, where, what do you think the Lord has been preparing you for? Or is that still something you're like, I'm trying to figure it out? Because, like, I mean, Ornadas, you've got your bachelor's, you've got all this uh, formation around the country, you've almost completed your master's in theology. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's something that what God has been preparing me for. It's something that I don't find out until after it's happened. So like, and when I look back on it, it, sometimes the answer is like right there. It's like God was preparing me to be the coordinator of Jornadas for the, that is specific escuelita for this period of time. And you know, I fulfilled it or, you know, something along those lines or God had always been preparing me to enter into this theology program. Um, but it's not something you know, that, that I see looking forward, like, oh, God is preparing me for this. I think uh, I might have mentioned it before, but God's been preparing me to, to enjoy the journey, enjoy where, wherever he's leading me. Cause I, you know, eight years ago when I started college, I could, I would have never imagined being, being here, being, doing whatever I'm doing now, whether I'm good at it or bad at it, <laughs> mostly bad at it, but you know, uh, and I'm, I'm open, I'm open to wherever he wants to take me. Yeah. I, I want to go back to St. Peter. Um, he you know, and his boldness and his love for the Lord was human like you and I. There came the moment when Jesus came to the point of his passion. And this, this Peter, this strong rock, denied Jesus three times. And I'm thinking of the, the time when, after having denied him the third time, the rooster crew or crowed or however you say it, and he looked into the eyes of Jesus, and within his soul just experienced that that sadness, and um, and he began to cry, he began to weep. Um, and this this may be personal, but when, if ever, have you wept like that, mm-hmm. having known Jesus and and having out that you betrayed him um uh, sure maybe not like like wept wept but you know whenever oh i could commit like venial sins or a mortal sin you know i'm always like man i'm better than this like having been on this on this path now for quite some time i'm like oh, i should be able to be better at avoiding sins my prayer life should be better my um, I should have, you know, I, there's just always this sense that, uh, I don't want to say it like that. Yeah, sure. I mean, I let, I let Jesus down, but, or it, I feel like, you know, um, I, I did let him down or, um, but, but like I said, I, I always go back. To, to confession because I know that the forgiveness is there um, so this, this is a stretch but I'm trying to I'm going to try to connect this question and the, this following one essentially Peter and Judas both betrayed Jesus right. right but Judas 
held on to that uh, shame, that regret, and did not repent in the sense of a conversion of heart. And another way to put it, he didn't allow Jesus to forgive him. Right? Yeah. And as, as a result, Judas held on to his pain and committed suicide. Whereas Peter, having denied him, ha having denied God, like literally God, he stayed till the end. And, P and Jesus forgave him and allowed him to, to say, Lord, I love you. Do you love me? Lord, I love you. Peter, do you love me? Lord, I love you. Three times in a way to make up for the three times that he denied him. Have you ever experienced that like forgiveness of God where it's like, wow, I did this, but it's almost as if you brought something greater out of it, if that makes sense. So one time I went to confession, right? And the penance was, was I want you to, the priest told me, I want you to sit in the pews until you feel forgiven. Right? And that, that, that feeling never came, <laughs> but, but you know, that, that always stayed with me because I was like, I don't know if I, if forgiveness is a feeling, but it, it's like, it's a fact. So like, I, yeah, like, you know, I got the absolution or, you know, Jesus forgives me. So, you know, it's, it's not really something I need to always feel. And sure. I like, I'll have those moments where like, you know, the emotions hit, but you no, know, for the most part, like. Uh, I accept, I accept the forgiveness, but, um, well, let you know. me rephrase it. Cause I know I got kind of got confusing at the last part. Yeah. Yeah. So in part, Jesus forgave him, but it was followed by go feed my sheep. Right. So it was like, you did these terrible things. I forgive you. And I'm still calling you to be Peter, to be the yeah. leader. Like, and it's kind of tied to that, where do you feel God is calling you? But I don't know, what, what, what do you think about um, when Jesus, having you gone through what you've gone through, like, what, what, would you, what would you say if right now Jesus was like, Santiago, go and feed my sheep? Yeah, so... I don't know if this will answer the question, but uh, the closest uh, analogy maybe that that fits into my life is that it's in Jornadas. Like, you know, uh, as a leader, sometimes you make mistakes and you hurt somebody um, unintentionally, intentionally sometimes. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah. So, and in, unintentionally, you can hurt somebody unintentionally. You can make a decision that poorly affects somebody else or you make a decision that, you know, sometimes you don't always make the best decision for the group as a leader. Um, and, you know, and learning to accept those, those mistakes that I've made or times where I've gotten it wrong. Um, I feel like Jesus is always like, you know, don't give up, just keep going. You know? Uh, the mis the mistake will only be a failure if you quit now. If you keep going, then the failure isn't really a failure. It's oh, it'll help you get to a better answer. I don't know if there will ever be like an absolute answer of how to do like coronadas or ministry, Hispanic ministry, young adult ministry in that sense. But um, I think as long as we keep trying, always something there to that. And then uh, we're going to be wrapping up soon. Going back to Jornadas. Um, I don't know, like, what, what would you say to the, the, the current team, current leadership, current members? And also perhaps, you know, there's, there's going to be a time when I'm not in Jornadas. There's going to be a time when you're not in Jornadas. Like, but what, what parting words would you or words of wisdom would you give to that generation? Oh, I, got, no. huh? <laughs> I was going to say, get your act right. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, 
try not to say something sarcastic or, or mean. <laughs> I, I think they'd appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> they'd, be, they'd be like, that's just like him. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, no, something I always tell them is um, some, of the, some of the people in the group, I kind of jokingly say it, but I'm like, I'm praying on your downfall so you can grow in humility. Wow. <laughs> But I don't really pray on their downfall. I pray that they grow in humility, but not on their downfall. Um, so, no, prayer. I think prayer is the answer. Um, so as an individual or as a group, keeping spiritual life. Um, what's the word? Keeping it not up to date. Keeping it consistent or, you know, never departing from Jesus or Mary is, is probably the most important thing because it's so easy for the group to, to devolve into just like a hangout group. And sometimes it loses its mission in that sense. So maybe that's my, my words of, I don't know if it's wisdom, but. <laughs> okay. um, I know I've been like picking at your brain for a minute. And sometimes my questions aren't the most clear. But this, the last one that I want to throw at you is this. I want you to go back to that bonfire eight or whatever years ago it was. You're with a group of friends. It's a peaceful time learning about Jesus, learning about faith, having a talk in your heart about who this Jesus is and what he means in your life. What would you say to that Santiago then, if you could tell him anything? And this wouldn't affect... It won't anything. affect the time. It, it wouldn't affect time. <laughs> what are the rules we're putting that the are butter, at stake what is it, the, the butterfly effect? Yeah, <laughs> yeah no. Uh, no, I'd probably just uh, give him some words of, uh, you know, consolation. Kind of what, what Jesus said to Peter, do not be afraid. No, I think I, I've held myself back for the most part journey um, by being afraid or, um, you know, by being afraid of what people might think, by being afraid that, you know, I might not be good enough to do something big in my life or I don't even know if I'm doing something big. You know, I think maybe that, that fear, you know, to some extent it might hold a lot of people back. And so maybe that words of, you know, a lot you're capable of more than you think oh yeah nice yeah so uh to the listeners i know this is a curveball at you guys but that message was for you too so uh so <laughs> i didn't tell him in advance because he'd be like oh this is <laughs> but uh, that that's what i was getting at too it wasn't what you were expecting, like with the guitar guy who I don't yeah. know where it was like, I knew there was something to it. <laughs> but yeah, thank you for those words. Uh, Santiago, thank you so much for, for joining us on this fourth season, being the first <clears throat> guest for this season and for the gift you have given me for coming all the way to Detroit. It was a three hour drive. Uh, I like to close off these podcasts by having the guests close this off in prayer. And then I'm going to Look at the audience. I'm going to tell them to pray the rosary. You will say, pray the rosary. And then together, the third time, we will say, pray the rosary. So okay. this is often the trickiest part. <laughs> and we'll see if you could get it. So if yeah. you could close us off in prayer. Oh, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, I would just ask you that in this day, that you remind us to not be afraid, to strive Strive for holiness, strive to be saints. And I would ask that you console any, any pain in the hearts of the listeners. And lastly, just thank you for all the blessings in our lives, um, all the good things and even all the bad things, because sometimes the bad things are, draws us nearer to you. I would ask on the feast day of Our Lady of Fatima, the intercession for everybody listening, um, and specifically for Cafe Con Santos, uh, Ricardo. Um, so he may continue to do this great work. I ask you this in the name of 
Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Father. Amen. The Father and the Son and the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Well, that wraps things up, guys. Thank you for listening this far. My microphone keeps falling down, and I think that's a sign that the microphone is getting tired. <laughs> If you would like to support the mission of Café con Santos, you can do so by liking and subscribing to this YouTube channel. You can go to our Facebook page where we pray a daily rosary, and you could also share these videos with your family, friends, and anybody you want to share this with. I hope that you have an awesome rest of the day, and please, 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 Always remember, pray the rosary. Pray the rosary. Pray, pray the, the rosary. rosary. All right, you got it right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>